I'd like to talk to you today about some housing projects that we worked on in the UK using framework agreements, the PPC 2000 contract, and basically collaborative working methods to deliver these projects. Um, I think I would start off first by talking a little bit about the background of what was going on in the UK at the time. There was a bit of a cultural revolution went on in, uh, within the construction industry. Um, during the 1990s, there was a series of government reports, first by the, the Conservative Party, uh, uh, Sir Michael Latham, who uh, David alluded to earlier on, uh, wrote, a, wrote a report about the construction industry. Now, if I'm not wrong, David, he came from, I think, the car industry, something like that? No, Egan came from Egan, the car uh, Egan came from the car industry, yeah. Uh, but he came from a background that wasn't directly construction, and he brought a breath of fresh air and some new ideas into the way we worked. Although, when we first all read it, we thought, you know, what's this guy know? It's more, far more complicated than that. But um, what he kicked off was a cultural revolution. And David just mentioned Egan. So John Egan was another uh, uh, evangelist of rethinking construction and changing construction. And he, he was appointed by the Labour Party to look into the construction industry. So we had the Conservatives followed by a Labour Party report. And something happened that very rarely happens in politics. They agreed. <clears throat> So John Egan more or less agreed with what Latham had, had laid down as being very, very logical. To my mind, the big change he made was he set some targets, he set some timelines, and he set some, some objectives to achieve. And uh, that started the ball rolling. Um, there was, I, I mentioned there was a cultural revolution. At the time, there was a lot of agendas like um, rethinking construction, like setting up uh, construction uh, nationwide KPIs for the construction industry, uh, setting up um, uh, best practice examples, so there was best practice case studies for, for other organizations to follow, and all of this was open source on the web, you know, that technology had, had hit the world and everybody had access to it by then, so it really was a revolution of timing, technology, ideology, and a lot of things happened just at the right time to bring about a very significant change, and a change for, hopefully, which, which fortunately transpired for the lives of a lot of our tenants living in our properties. Um, I'm going to start off by, I'll come back to this a little bit later, but basically this is what we were about. We were about bringing about a big change into people's lives, modernizing their lives with modern practices. Um, I started uh, my career with, with uh, social housing in the UK with Sentinel Housing Group. Well, actually, it's, it's forerunner. Heart Housing Association became Heartvale, became Sentinel. So as we expanded and, and merged with some other organizations, we shape-shifted and changed name over time. Um, we were in the business, we were based in Hampshire, we became the biggest housing association based in Hampshire, and just to put that in perspective, Hampshire is the biggest county in England, in the UK, so uh, we became the biggest housing association in the biggest county. Uh, we were doing a lot, but not like some of the London boroughs, which had other, other uh, types of issues. We had a lot of greenfield sites, we also had a lot of brownfield sites, we had a lot of things to play with. Um, we had a very healthy development program, and David uh, mentioned the Amphion Consortium. One of the things I led on for Sentinel was the Amphion Consortium, which was an off-site, which was a model. Uh, we wanted to do an experiment and test off-site construction methods. So prefab is a dirty word in many people's vocabularies, but Germans have been doing it quite successfully in Scandinavians for quite some time. So why, why couldn't we? So we, we got together with a number of other housing associations. In the end, it turned out to be 22 housing associations. And we all put some of our development pot into building these houses. And what we wanted to do was establish KPIs. Now, there's a number of academic papers that are, uh, have been written about what we did and the KPIs and the kind of work, so you can, you can, you can find the documents. There's often, also a lot of uh, trade and articles written about um, 
written about the project as it rolled out over a number of years. So it's fairly well known and dear to some of our hearts uh, a project. And it was a very, very interesting move in technology, but particularly a move in project management and planning of projects where we could look uh, at the respect agendas of the, 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 the continuity of work for people working on building sites. They weren't just commodities. They were people. They had families. They lived in communities. Um, we wanted to keep some sort of continuity going in workflow. We wanted to keep uh, health and safety as a high part of the agenda. That became a legislative high part of the agenda later on, where a client had ultimate responsibility for things going wrong. Um, but we wanted to have these, we wanted to have predictability, predictability of top, time, cost, uh, predictability of quality, and those form the core of our KPIs, and we, we roll this project out as a, as a bit of research. Um, interestingly, we looked at a, 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 at a variety of ways of doing this, and we, uh, we all came to the conclusion that the PPC 2000 was the one that lent itself because we needed to bring in contractors early. We needed to have two-stage open book tendering where the contractors tendered, then we rationalized things because 22 Housing Associates, we've got a big committee there working on, on decision making. Um, but not only that, we, 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 we were going through a big learning curve and it was a very iterative process. And I'm gonna come back to that a little bit later. But for me, the PPC, one of the beauties of the PPC was it allows for iterative thinking. It allows innovation and innovative thinking. And as anybody knows who innovates, it's a very iterative process. Because you go a little bit, you make mistakes, you have to go back and, and move on, learn by the mistakes and keep building as you go along. And, and you know, you're, you're heading in the right direction ultimately. But if you have an adversarial type of arrangement, it's dead in, any kind of innovation is dead in the water in my view. Um, so the PPC lends itself very much to that. At the same time, on our regeneration of existing housing stock, the government had just rolled out a, a, a new scheme for social housing rents uh, where, called rent harmonization, where if you lived in Scotland or you lived in the south of England, you would be paying the same social rent if your house had the same attributes, i.e. Uh, it's kitchen, bathroom, central heating, double glazing, all these kind of things, the energy efficiency of the house, uh, related to each other, you'd be paying the same rents. If you lived near a bus stop, near shops, near a doctor's surgery, you'd be paying. So the whole, the whole point scoring system for paying rents was based on these attributes. And one of the things we had to do, the government introduced the rental harmonization, followed by refurbishment programs to catch up, a decent homes program it was called, to catch up the housing stock and harmonize it across the UK. Um, I noticed they introduced the rent harmonization first, followed by the work later, but there you go. That's the cynic in me. Um, so we said about that, we were one of the first housing associations in the UK to finish, hit the deadline and hit the target of the Decent Homes program by, uh, by repairing and modernizing uh, our housing stock. Um, again, we used the PPC 2000 on that because we got our fingers burnt early on by lessons that had to be learned as we were going along. One thing that happens in housing that is different to uh, uh, housing refurbishment that is different to other forms of building contracting is the contractor doesn't have exclusive possession of the site. There's a family living in there coming and going. Their friends are coming and going. All kinds of things happen all the time, and we have to be mindful of that. Um, when I finished down with Sentinel, I moved up to the London Borough of Hackney. This is Hackney here. Um, there's 32, just to put it in perspective, there's about 32 boroughs in London. They're all egging on trying to reach this decent homes program. So Armitage Shanks can only produce so many toilet seats. Yeah? So you, uh, straight away, you get a bit of an idea. Um, Hackney, by the way, had 36,000 social houses. So that was one borough of 32 boroughs. Um, and you can imagine, people like Armitage Shanks would have been on a big boom and bust curve if they had to try and keep up with the program. We wouldn't have been able to get supply. So we had to start looking at our supply chains and how that operated. 
So we had to have the contractors in early. Hey, here we go again, PPC 2000. Uh, we also had to break the work down. We had to do a big stock condition survey, get the gist of what the stock looked like, because surprise, surprise, we, uh, we would have had lots of pieces of paper in the office um, that described the stock, but it hadn't been computerized, or to some degree was computerized. Don't forget, it's the age that every, all of this kind of computerization, all of this going on. BIM hadn't happened yet, but had it been there, it would have been an extremely useful tool. Um, and uh, the, this contracting dimension to BIM would have even made life much more gloriously simple. Of course, we still would have needed the, the legal contracts and the frameworks because those would have been the parameters in which we would have been programming into these programs uh, to, to have our payment cycles, to have our what, what standard of work is agreed. We still need a specification. We still need all of these kind of things. It's just life on a massive scale is made an awful lot easier, or the logistics of it made easier by this kind of um, process. So, 36,000 properties, we went out, we took a look at them, and lo and behold, we found that about 18,000 were within economic repair. Um, by that I mean uh, the money we would invest in replacing things like the kitchens, the bathrooms, the central heating, uh, rewiring, um, double glazing windows, putting in insulation into walls, this kind of thing, bringing them up to, to uh, more modern energy standards. Um, you know, they, they were within the payback, within the rent, rent cycle payback periods, that would have worked. There were some that you would throw money at them and you still would never have a satisfactory building. They were beyond economic repair. Uh, there were a number when they had the I can never remember now. So the Victoria Line, the real deep tube, uh, tube line. So the deep. Let's go with that. Okay, let's go with that one. Yeah. <laughs> I feel so much better, David, when you. <laughs> um, so the the Victoria Line, uh, they they extracted a lot of the clay from that very deep line, and they dumped it all up here in the north of Hackney. Well, lo and behold, somebody in the bright uh, had the bright idea of building lots of. Um, uh, very tall buildings, densely uh, populated in, in the area, and while well, the buildings all by the time I came along were all populated with telltales. Anybody know what a telltale is? Yeah. Yeah, what is it? <laughs> yeah, it's a monitor that monitors? <laughs> Cracking, yeah, yeah, because all of these were starting to, uh, lots of these were starting to sink into this clay, and you know, we, we had structural problems, but very major structural problems. Uh, when we got there. And don't forget, there's families living in these. Now, here's where bringing your contractor in early, bringing your designers, your two, tier one, two, three, and whoever else you can bring in, because what you're looking at is brain power and people power to try and master this problem. Because what they're doing is they're delivering something for the end user. The client, the, per the, 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 the tenant, not me, the client, but the tenant who lives in these. Um, and one person or a team, a small team working in an office, it doesn't have enough brain power to get their head around such a massive dynamic problem as this. Um, we had to move families like a Rubik's Cube. Decant people out of one area, move them. Now, you've got to remember that somehow you've got to maintain communities because people come from communities. They have children who go to schools, they have doctors, GPs, they have all of this kind of thing. So we're, we're now trying to figure out how do we start this process of moving people around because we have to take people out so we can do something with the buildings, not necessarily the refurbishment work, but when it comes to demolition, We've got to, uh, we, we, we certainly got to move them out then. And we got to find somewhere else for people to move into. And there's not a lot of available housing stock. Um, so this became an, an enormous logistics problem. And a great thing is when you have the, we've heard examples earlier on of the contractors and the subcontractors, the tier two and three and the suppliers uh, coming on board with ideas. 
they're bringing fresh ideas, a fresh perspective, and a completely other perspective, that and telling you things that you never thought about in the beginning, and they're helping you to resolve your problem. And this is collaboration. It's it's these guys are coming with a solution to you. They're not just coming to deliver something. They're coming with their brains. They're intelligent people. They're collaborating. We're people working together. And that's the key to collaboration. Um, it's not about doctrine. It's not about anything else. It's about a framework where people are able to work together <coughs> and find solutions. Um, so we set about our, our uh, program right across the London Borough of Hackney. And I think we did probably, uh, over the number of years, I, I, I heard somewhere that it was one of the biggest or most disparate construction projects that went on in London for a very long time. It certainly equaled, if not exceeded, what the Luftwaffe did in the Second World War to, to, to that part of London. And as you can imagine, you know, we get an awful lot of consultation that had to go on. And people felt maybe they weren't getting the consultation they needed to hear. On consultation, every time I wrote a letter to the residents of an area, in a, in a dispersed uh, uh, place like Hackney, we, I had to have that letter translated into 150 different languages. That, that alone shows you the communication issues were going to be a barrier. So when we went out into communities talking with people, and again, this is when you have your, your contractors and your suppliers and everybody, you just need the manpower or the people power to get out there and physically cover the territory and talk with people because you need people to be on your side. You don't want people protesting. You don't want people slowing, disrupting the thing down. You want to create, work with a community, create it, make the thing happen. And that's very hard. That's very labor intensive. And it becomes an even bigger dimension than the simple technology of building construction. I mean, we can all do that with our eyes closed. Um, unless you're a lawyer, maybe. But uh, anyway, the, we, we can all do that with our eyes closed. Um, the, so we had a major uh, undertaking with our consultations. We finally started bringing about agreement. We had to in, in, incorporate into our contracts. Here's where the iterativeness goes, because we'll sit down and we'll all probably design things in a similar way and come up with a solution to a problem. And then somebody else comes along and it's like, tear that up and start again. So we had the scope to be iterative. We had the scope to learn by our mistakes. We had the scope to learn better ways of doing things and continuously improve. And thrown onto the pot of all of that as if that wasn't enough, the government were breathing down our back saying, you have to make 15 to 20% cost savings on your contracts. Now, Noel <laughs> Uh, may, may tell you a little bit later, um, and I won't steal much of his thunder, but uh, a lot of public sector at the time had issues with delivering contracts on time and on budget. And this was a whole cultural revolution to turn that and head work totally differently and um, make these savings as we went along. And it was surprising how our contractors, suppliers, subcontractors, everybody was coming to us with ideas for making savings. And it was even more surprising that we could get the public sector, the, the finance departments and, and the councils, the councillors, to agree that if we found a, a saving, we would share the savings. So whoever came up with the idea, they get 30%, we were mean. They get 30%, we keep 70. Now that 70 would go back into the program and help us, uh, help us deliver the program as, as it moved, moved along. So. Um, it was, it was great, the things we learned. The things that I had learned all my life about working in construction. And some of the positions I'd taken because of risk, because of what I perceived the other parties might want or be thinking about, and I was completely wrong. And I'd been working in the construction industry well over 20 years, so I, I learned a lot of new lessons just working with these people. So anyway, we, we set about, we did, did an awful lot of demolition, so we did major refurbishment on 18,000 properties. 
we did a demolition on about 7,000 properties and freed up uh, other properties. The Olympics was, uh, one of the Olympics was based in Hackney Downs, which was Hackney's territory. And um, so the land was given over to the Olympics and part of the deal was half of the athlete's accommodation would be turned over to social housing and the other half would be sold in the open market. And Hey, Presto, we found another way of moving, you know, from the war zone, our big refugee uh, crisis of our own that we've created. So, um, in the end, uh, right across Hackney, uh, we, we saw a number of refurbishments that really changed the whole look, the whole appeal of the place. Um, uh, we, we, we started, uh, one big thing that often gets overlooked in building projects is we get these nice looking buildings and nice places to park cars, but often spaces just for people to, to live. Um, our communities were fantastic in guiding us, leading us, informing us, and shaping our ideas. Um, and it was really great fun in changing the spaces and changing the way people, people live. Now this does have an effect on crime, it does have an effect on, on future attainment of, of kids and every, everybody like this. It does, it's a very healthy, holistic approach to communities. And we're kind of going through a moment like this in Ireland, where we're having a whole series of things merge together. We've just learned a lot of lessons, economic, structural, contractual, all kinds of lessons. Now, now we're at a moment that you know, we in this room can shape the future of where construction, what our delivery for our communities, our people, our housing, our building, our technology. There's a, there's a lot of ingredients and a lot of opportunities for us to, to bring about a sea change here in Ireland, what's happening. And it's certainly doable. Um, it's already been said, we, most people recognize this straight away. Uh, we have the traditional way of doing things where we have the ease of, do, of, of making change at the beginning versus the cost of change. And in traditional forms of contracting, if we get all of our design here up front um, and we have a very good idea what it is, we've got a bill of quantities, show my age now, we've got our bill of quantities, we've got our fully designed out BIM on a disc. Um, we, we, we have everything at this stage. Um, well, great, we can control our costs and control our time, but life doesn't work that way, especially when there's competing interests, when there's people involved, end users have, have needs. Those needs are changing rapidly. Um, we're trying to hit markets before things change too much. We're living in a much, much faster paced world, whether we're working in social housing or the commercial sector. There's a lot happening very, very rapidly. Um, my personal experience has taught me that the PPC 2000, as individual contracts, it's great for individual contracts, it allows a degree of collaboration, it allows, uh, it encourages collaboration, and it allows a degree within that of it, uh, iteration. A PPC would be like the egg, it's an individual project. A framework agreement, the, the FAC1, is like the basket where you have all of your eggs in the basket. And from that, you're able to integrate lessons learned, you're able to uh, flow across ideas, economies of scale. We even, on, just to put it in perspective of how well collaboration went within Hackney, we even had our contractors, when there was labor uh, employed, in its simplest sense, one contractor would need painters this week, but would need carpenters next week. But this contractor needed carpenters this week and maybe needed painters next week. And what were they doing? They were exchanging their labor force. Still working for the same company, but they were starting to transfer their labor force. So there was no boom and bust in, in their supply chain. There was nobody idle and nobody over, overworked. Um, we got together with the local employment services. We set up a youth... Uh, youth apprenticeship schemes and because of the length of the program that these people were able to go all the way through their apprenticeship become skilled people and still have a job at the end of it and still keep going and this became a demonstration project that led on to uh, a group 
where there was a grouping of local authorities came together uh, called the Supply Chain Management Group, um, which Nea is going to talk about more of. But it started with Hackney and Harringay, that council just, just above Hackney, and um, it then rolled out from there, where other, other groups came along to share ideas, share lessons learned, and get their programs rolling along too. Um, you know that you've kind of done something well when you're starting to get positive feedback. Now people don't always write you letters because some just can't be bothered sitting down and writing and others don't even speak English. Um, we got some letters but one of, the, one of the things that always stays with me was when your detractors uh, at the outset become your loyal supporters and they're egging you on in the process and <laughs> <laughs> so and these are real pictures from Hackney. Um, okay, I'm gonna leave it there. Uh, sorry? <laughs> well <laughs> that's why they never wrote a letter. There you go. Thank you.